is ready to fight his own battle and show that after all, the black man is capable of managing the whole of us. We're going to go into a three-year program with the IMF. It will be the last time we'll have to go to the IMF again for any such program. This is why we got into the IMF. You were spending too much relative to revenues, which is true. You were borrowing too much, which is true. Your external payments position has deteriorated, which is true. I'm also pleased to report that the three-year IMF Supported Extended Credit Facility Program began in 2015 comes to an end this year. We will not go to the IMF today, we will not go to IMF tomorrow, and we are not going as long as the NPP remains in power. Don't let anybody tell you we are not people of short sight. Suddenly, we were having, facing major challenges on our balance of payments, our currency went into a steep decline, interest rates went out of the window, inflation, uh, all the, the indices that had been worked on. And that is what basically forced us to go to seek the assistance of the fund. The public debt has reached a level over 112 billion cities as of September this year. The total debt of Ghana is nearing some 200 billion Ghana cities. Ghana has added 10.7 billion Ghana cities to its public debt stock in just four months. The IMF is projecting that Ghana's debt to GDP ratio could reach worrying levels by the end of the year. The end of the slave trade corresponded with the Industrial Revolution. The demand by European powers for Africa's tangible commodities like gold, cash crops, fossil fuels and metals were on the ascendancy. After more than 60 years of independence, Ghana remains heavily reliant on foreign exchange returns from three principal commodities, gold, cocoa and now oil, which together account for more than 80% of the country's exports. Historically, Ghana has enjoyed a lot of debt cancellations and technical defaults, including the famous Yentia policy announced by Champon in 1972. The problem is that historically, we always hit a roadblock where we just have to go and get beg our creditors to forgive us. We've not been able to figure that out. Where we borrow money, we attract more capital, we transform the nature of our economy by building the right factories, the right schools, the right hospitals. Our people become much more productive. They start to produce a lot locally. We have a lot more money. We stop having to borrow so much. And then we are suddenly in alignment with our commitments to our creditors, for instance. The historical evidence is that we always struggle with that goal. And we've been trying for many, many years. So after Osagefo borrowed quite a bit to try and build all these factories and to create an industrialization plan for the country and execute on that plan, you find that by the time he was overthrown, the country was so indebted that we literally could not pay our debts. And the, the, the first thing that happened was that the military rulers in 1967 then went for an IMF program, which you saw. But that IMF program was supposed to be extended. They were supposed to get a bit more money and do more reforms. So if you look there, you see that 1966, right after the overthrow, we get a standby arrangement, meaning that we just told them, oh, we're just having some um, um, sudden um, shocks. So can you just give us some money to figure it through? So all throughout that period, we could never agree, agree with, with, with the fund, the IMF, uh, a real program of reform, you know, a structural reform program. Bright Simmons, an avowed apostle of economic reforms, speaks profoundly on Ghana's debt cancellation. Collecting a small, small amount of money until we went into a proper program in 1983, and then that led us into a full-scale program which are the standard fund facility, 
in 87. Before we got to that period, we were just doing standby arrangements, just collecting money to fix you know, a few problems. And then by 1970, the government was of the view that it couldn't pay at all. You know, even with, with all the you know, support that was coming in, it just could not. So the British government agreed to host a debt conference in London in a place called Marlborough House, where it invited all our other creditors. And then Ghana sent a delegation led by the finance minister then, the Honorable D.H. Mensah, and you can see the Honorable um, John Ajikum Kufo on the left, who was then the deputy foreign minister. And the two of them were the leaders of our delegation. We went into this debt conference and we started to talk about debt relief. Eventually, this led to about half of our debt more or less being wiped away. The 1974 um, situation, which followed this one, because remember that in 1972, the, that government was then overthrown, a military government came, and the famous Yen Tria was then announced by the government, which was a unilateral. So this government, the, the government before, had done a, a, a multilateral mechanism, or had embarked upon a multilateral mechanism to get relief for debt. The, the new government initially what, didn't want to go through that process anymore because obviously we were going to say we just finished a multilateral renegotiation. What are you talking about? So they repudiated that arrangement. They said we're not going to follow it. You know, all the agreements that were made in Marlborough House, they said we're not interested. This was something that had been done by new colonialists. They were a more um, progressive government. They didn't want to be bound by what had been agreed in Marlborough House in London. Eventually, that led to huge problems because we lost credibility in the international market. And so the government eventually then agreed to. Um, um, a discussion with its creditors and some kind of technical default. Ghana's economy is fragile. The IMF has helped with loans, but ordinary workers still haven't seen much benefit. Political stability remains elusive and Rowling's own position is far from secure. 1982, also, we went into another technical default because when the new government came to power, they do the usual thing they do. They blame the previous governments for all the debt and they call them odious debt. And they just couldn't pay as well because during that period, we had huge problems with reserves. Um, and then the drought had happened um, or the drought was just about to happen. Then we got people kicked out from Nigeria. So we, lot, we had a lot of financial difficulties in the, in the period. And in 18, uh, 1982, we, we went into another default situation. were described as not credit worthy. No, no creditors will continue to give us uh, credit lines to, to run the business of government for the nation. And since we had only four years to prove that we could govern, uh, we, we might be worse off than what we inherited. So we decided to go the Hedrick way. And it worked. Ghana was the second biggest beneficiary of debt relief literally in the world, though this is a list of African countries, in terms of the proportion of your GDP and as a proportion of how much debt that was you know, forgiven, Ghana was number two on the, on, on the list of African countries at least. So you see that we have huge benefits from HIPIC, more than uh, $6 billion of money was freed up uh, for us. Ghana's dependence on commodity exports never ended, and as prices surged, this generated more willingness for lenders to give loans off the back of a growing economy. As part of a worldwide boom in primary commodity prices, significantly impacted by Chinese growth and demand, on top of sustained increased consumption in rich North American, European and Asian economies, gold and cocoa prices started to rise in the mid-2000s. Ghana discovered oil and by 2011, the country had started producing and exporting its first barrels of crude oil. I do not want Ghanaians to think that the oil discovery is the end of everything. That is the end of the journey. If anything, it's the beginning of the journey. We want to make sure that we derive the maximum benefit from the oil. But that should not take away attention from the other very important areas, agriculture. No nation can flourish without a strong agricultural base. What kind of growth are you looking for for 2011 for Ghana? Well, anything in the teens should be okay for us, 14%, 15%. In January 2011, Ghana was said to become the fastest growing economy in sub-Saharan Africa, as projected 
by the World Bank with an end period growth rate of 13.4%. Indeed, Ghana ended 2011 with a growth rate of 14%, 0 0.6 percentage points higher than what was projected after slowing down from 14% to 9.3% in 2012. The unexpected happened. The prices of gold and oil both slammed significantly in early 2013. Ghana's growth rate followed with an unstoppable free fall. And before the dawn of 2015, the country's growth rate had been truncated from 14% in 2011 to 2.9% in 2014. By 2015, Ghana's economy was in trouble, hobbled by widening current account and budget deficits, rampant inflation and a depreciating currency. Credit dried up as interest rates rose and banks' bad loans piled up. Precisely because the structure of the economy explains a lot of the things that you see at the macro level and even at the micro level. So that is fine because essentially we, are, we don't add margins to the uh, primary commodities. And look, the world thrives on margins. To the extent that you are not adding margins, you are not getting value. And therefore, you don't command price in the market. Okay. The resilience of our economy is very susceptible to shocks particularly from commodity crisis and if you look at it since the 60s the shocks that we have experienced either coming from the commodity side financial or whatever it impacts us heavily because the structure of the economy it's it's, it's, it's just not uh, and we've been talking about this for years the borrowing came a vicious cycle and ghana couldn't escape the trap even after debt forgiveness at the root of ghana's woes was out-of-control government spending, largely to pay salaries of an overgrown civil service. After several considerations, Ghana was back to the IMF seeking a fresh bailout. This was our 16th. Seth Tepe was finance minister in 2015. He led the team to secure a $918 million loan facility, which was approved on April 3, 2015, after going through all negotiations. In our case, we were in a fund program. Remember the Kufa administration was yeah. in a fund program as it said. Professor Mears went to a fund program. But remember we also said that we came to the conclusion that we wanted to do homegrown policy. We wanted to see whether we could stand on our own feet. Based on partially on what I said, fiscal discipline, but also utilizing part of the oil revenue mm -hmm. to start to resolve some of the things we were not doing well. So you saw the stabilization fund, heritage fund, which is savings. You know, you saw allocation to GMPC, you know, to do exploration and others, innovative things, contingency fund, sinking fund, so that we stop that habit of borrowing and not paying. So we, the PRMA set up those, those structures, you know, and, and they help. But then we suffered some crisis. The global financial crisis was one, which was 2000, 2008, 2009, when Professor Mears, you know, came in. And then we had a single spine challenges. And then the disruption in gas supply, you know, from Nigeria, which gave us that word, could do so. You know, we think it's, it's a non-performance, but that was the cause, you know. And then we waited two, three years, and it wasn't being resolved, you know. So we decided to do the badges and the other things. Um, but the most critical one was the boring, heavy boring that was being done for single spine and the rest. So the, the fiscal became a bit shaky, right? But we were confident that we could do it homegrown. But by the time we went to Sinchi and uh, looked at the policies and the rest, we realized, you know, that it was going to be difficult. And then as, you know, was the case, the development partners also decided that, you know, they didn't think we could handle this, this program ourselves which is part of the, the markets also, where you borrow sovereign money and the rest. Uh, they look to the IMF, which is a lender of last resort. Not just that, but the IMF also, under the Article 4 of its protocol, which you sign to, whether you're in a fund program or not, they'll come and inspect your books. Yeah. And they will tell it as it is. So once that is published, that was published, the markets began to wonder, you know, whether, you know, we could go it alone. And so we had to, that's why having the homegrown policy, which we drew with the assistance of African Development Bank, we decided, 
you know, to do the IMF program, the ECF. But we didn't, whilst we were doing that, we continued mm -hmm. without seeking for another policies, stabilization fund, some of which came in handy, you know, during the COVID crisis. We never stopped just because we had IMF money, no. We're going to go into a three-year program with the IMF. It will be the last time we'll have to go to the IMF again for any such program. This will be the IMF program to end all programs. As suspected, a few months after IMF came to Ghana's rescue, things started to shape up again. According to the Bank of Ghana's summary data, the city's cumulative depreciation against the dollar dropped from 19.9% by 2015 to 15.7% are the dying numbers of the year. By August 2015, month-on-month -month inflation had dropped from 1.8% in April to a negative figure of 0.8% by the end of August 2015. One target of Ghana's 16th IMF program was to help restore our debt burden to sustainable levels. The government limited hiring and wage increases and eliminated subsidies for utilities and petroleum products. To raise revenue, it cracked down on tax evasion and rationalized exemptions. New revenue sources including a tax on luxury cars and increased taxes on high earners. To put Ghana's finances on sound footing, the new Public Financial Management Act called for improved accounting standards, procedures and technology. Professor Bopin explains why the 16th IMF program failed. The 16th IMF program conferred on Ghana significant credit worthiness and after almost a year without access, the country was back to the eurobond market for more foreign liquidity. The 16th IMF program actually failed on one of its objectives, which was to substantially bring down debt. So the 16th IMF program really did not do much in terms of uh, bringing Ghana's debt to a sustainable level. Former Finance Minister Seth Tepe speaks about the reliance on the eurobond and TBOs. We fell into the habit, if you ask, of borrowing first domestic treasury bills. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of a treasury bill? Treasury bill is for liquidity. That's why it's only 90 days, no, 91 days. And usually at the beginning of the year, you cannot reduce certain expenditures, wages and the rest. So you borrow short term, it's 90 days, three months, and then for exigencies. Then when the revenue starts coming, you pay off because for only 90 days. Yeah. Then we started rolling over. We started borrowing instead of making provision to pay it down, right? We, we will take the first treasury bill yes, and then okay. come 90 days. Every, every week we are taking it. Come 90 days, instead of putting money aside to repay that one, then we add that one to the current debt we want to finance. And then, you know, we take more loans. So the non-payment resulted in more borrowing and more borrowing. But we carried, began to carry that fiscal indiscipline to the uh, sovereign bond market. Mm -hmm. So we're issuing only interest only loans and the rest. And then the 10 years caught up with us, which was what we realized in 2014 that we're just paying on the interest and you can't be in the capital markets if you don't have a mechanism for repayment, which, which is a simple explanation for the thinking fund, which coincidentally is in the constitution, but it's optional, mm. which means that the framers of the constitution, including finance ministers and others, may have known that there was that weakness and we needed to set it up. Contingency fund in the constitution, we never set it up. So with the advent of oil, the question you asked, we decided, let us begin to channel part of the oil revenue, which is new, to resolve, you know, some of these things, you know, if you like, bad practices. In less than six months into the 16th IMF program, the government gathered a North credit worthiness and was back in the eurobond market to borrow $1 billion. By September 2016, amount borrowed under the Mahama administration had reached $3.75 billion with an average interest rate slightly above 9%. December 2016 came with a thunderbolt. It was time for the electorates to decide.
The elections were fought on the turf of the economy. This is why we got into the IMF. You were spending too much relative to revenues, which is true. You were borrowing too much, which is true. Your external payments position has deteriorated, which is true. After eight years of power, the National Democratic Congress, led by John Dramani Mahama, suffered a huge shock. The party lost the national election by a huge margin. A new messiah, Nana Adudankwa Ekufo Ado, was ushered into office to perform the badly needed surgical operation on the Ghanaian economy. By the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and the returning officer for the presidential election, it is my duty and my privilege to declare Nana Adudankwa Akufuado as a president elect of the Republic of Ghana. I, I, Nana Adudankwa Akufuado. There was a new breath of hope. A new team was to steer the economic affairs of the country. In fact, many believed that, with Dr. Baumia in the economic management seat, Ghana's economy would never slip back into coma. Fellow Kukrudites, we were elected to fix the problems and I'm glad to report that we are fixing the problems and we are putting in place the policies that will drive the economic transformation of this country.